Okay, so in this last session, um, we're going to talk uh, about increasing diversity among patient populations and care systems. And I'd like to um, introduce the, the members of, of this panel, panel six, and if you guys would uh, raise your hand. Um, so we have uh, Cynthia Powell, uh, Vince Bonham, and Craig Hannes, um, in addition to myself. So um, I'm going to... I'm going to present the slide deck, but the slide deck was was a cooperative um, effort among all the panel members, and so I'm going to walk through some of the main concepts represented in the slide deck, but then I'm going to ask for uh, the panel members um, actually to weigh in uh, and perhaps elaborate on some of the, the principles that are illustrated here. So uh, when I first thought about this um, concept, the uh, I really was focusing on the patient population, so how to get patient more diversity in, say, um, clinical trials, and that was my focus. But as soon as I, I submitted the draft slide deck around, it was clear that in, in the end of the day, um, the, the topic of diversity and the importance of diversity is not just in the patients that are accrued uh, to clinical trials, it's diversity throughout the entire spectrum of healthcare and healthcare research. And so this, this ends up being kind of a comprehensive uh, discussion represented in this slide deck. And I think, you know, when it comes to genomic medicine, to me there are two main issues that really are at the heart of what we're going to talk about. Um, one is that if we really want to get a handle on uh, all of the diversity or all the relevant diversity in the human population, uh, diversity of the patient populations used to define what that landscape of diversity is in the human population uh, is, is incredibly important, and it's also essential uh, for translating that information into something that, that can be brought into um, clinical practice. So uh, we all know uh, some of the main points here. Gender and ethnicity are important factors in disease presentation and treatment. Um, the safety and efficacy of medicines uh, require data from clinical trials with participants that represent the full spectrum of genetic diversity, and I think this is one of the real challenges that, uh, that we're facing in genomic medicine is, is getting to that point where we have that representation of the full spectrum of genetic diversity in human populations. Um, and, you know, if you, if you look at the trends uh, by 2020, uh, ethnic minorities will constitute about 35 percent of the American population. Um, and the last two points, the last two uh, numbers there, where African Americans make up currently 12 percent of the population, but just 5 percent of clinical trial participants. And for Hispanics, it make up 16 percent of our population, but just 1 percent of clinical trial applicants. I think really illustrates the gap and the gaps that we're facing um, that are really important to fill if we're going to have the impact that we want our science to have in genomic medicine. So when we were looking across the board at especially um, some of the NHGRI um, initiatives or initiatives that NHGRI is going to be an uh, important part of, such as precision medicine, um, a lot of the research programs that are in the portfolio right now um, do take into account or are trying to address some of these uh, diversity questions, and hopefully in the discussion, representatives of some of these programs can share with us their efforts in, in increasing diversity and also how they're addressing some of the barriers that we know um, that are being faced in doing so. Um, but uh, PAGE, Population Architecture Using Genomics and Epidemiology, certainly for that project to have the, uh, the impact scientifically, um, that it needs to have has to have um, representation um, from across the full spectrum of racial and ethnic um, diversity in the U.S. Um, the interpretation of the results, returning genomic results into electronic medical records, all of these things, um, there are diversity aspects to, um, and especially uh, precision medicine, which I think represents uh, one of the true opportunities um, that we have uh, going forward to help improve uh, representation. Um, barriers and opportunities, uh, the barriers uh, 
kind of outweigh some of the opportunities, at, at least in numbers at the, at the moment. But a lot of these are um, very difficult to address and aren't really necessarily scientifically easy to address. A lot of these have to do with culture and society. Um, and a few of them here are the influence of genomics data on concepts of race and ethnicity, already a very difficult subject to, to talk about in normal day-to-day -day conversation, um, but even more difficult when you think about what it means for medical practice. Um, physician attitudes and beliefs about race, health, and genetics, and how those influence how information is interpreted and then translated into practice. Um, there is a history, unfortunately, of, uh, that serves as a basis for mistrust of research motives among minority communities, and overcoming that history um, is, um, uh, is not an insurmountable uh, barrier, but it certainly is one. And part of that mistrust um, comes from the fact that there is often little visible return to the community for their participation in these research efforts. And uh, I think important lack of continuity uh, into the future uh, when people do participate in research trials. Uh, lack of involvement of minority investigators and physicians, uh, community stakeholders, language barriers, just general awareness of clinical trials and research opportunities. Um, time, because it does take a tremendous amount of time to participate in these things on both the patient's part and the physician's part. Um, and we all are aware in our own research lives uh, the bandwidth issues, and these are true uh, when we're trying to tackle the, the issue of diversity as well. Um, I think uh, one of the, the aspects, one of the barriers that came out, has come out several times in a number of studies, including the impact study, which I'll, I'll point to next, is the lack of access to clinical research coordinators. So really engaging communities in research trials and keeping them involved uh, really requires um, active participation by these research uh, coordinators. They're often essential for maintaining that sort of day-to-day -day contact. Um, and if they aren't available, again, probably more because of financial issues than anything else, um, it is certainly one of the things that I think um, impacts um, the fact that we don't have the diversity represented in these populations that we would like. Um, you know, one of the earlier slides showed, you know, the patient with all, like the Fitbits and the sensors and all of that kind of stuff. You know, and I think, you know, access to technology, that kind of technology, uh, you know, I don't own a Fitbit, but, you know, those kinds of things I think are actually going to become even bigger barriers, that kind of stuff. High-speed internet, so I live in Maine, which doesn't have a lot of racial or ethnic um, diversity, but certain socioeconomic diversity is, is key in Maine, and rural uh, geographic distribution of patient populations where there isn't a whole lot of uh, high-speed internet in Aroostook County where um, moose outnumber routers. Um, so I think these kinds of things have to be taken into account. Uh, ge geography and transportation, so the proximity to medical and research centers is another big barrier to increasing diversity among patient populations and care systems. Oops. And this is the impact study. So this was from 2008, and I was really uh, intrigued that many of these issues that were identified as, as barriers in terms of increasing minority participation and awareness in clinical trials, even in 2008, are still um, probably some of the main barriers um, that are being faced uh, today. So recruitment of minorities, what are some of the recommendations that the panel members came up with? And they're, they're illustrated here. Um, one is forming consultant groups for both researchers and physicians, so outreach education efforts. Um, that is certainly something that um, NHGRI has done and could continue to contribute to. Uh, recruiters who are culturally adept and fluent in the, in the language. Um, community assessment, because I think uh, there's not like one barrier that could be common to all communities. Like each community is going to have unique barriers that have to be addressed and overcome, and I think that kind of assessment has to be done. 
um, for uh, each case, an awareness of population beliefs, uh, the, the involvement of the community with advisory boards and local consultants, um, kind of a partnership model um, to engage, uh, educate, uh, work with different communities um, to, to, to bridge some of these, these gaps. These are some of the recommendations uh, of the panel, and I'm sure individual panel members will want to comment uh, specifically on some of these uh, bulleted points. Uh, for potential uh, synergies, again, for addressing that, the gap, uh, there are a number. So obviously there's a number of, of projects in the NHR, NHGRI portfolio where these gaps and these opportunities, uh, gaps could be identified and opportunities for addressing those gaps. Um, Vince wanted me to make sure that I mentioned the Precision Medicine Initiative and the fact that there is an RFI out now. It's, it's still active. You can still uh, contribute to that RFI um, on the Precision Medicine cohort. And I think that is one of the opportunities here um, that we have as a community to think about and have input on uh, addressing uh, gaps in diversity uh, that, that precision medicine initiative, I think, is an important one, uh, important opportunity uh, for uh, dealing with some of these things that we know are problems. There is an NIH Common Fund. We, that was NIH Common Fund and its role in some of these big community sort of initiatives and problems was mentioned last time, and there is actually an NIH Common Fund project for enhancing diversity in the NIH-funded workforce which is not specifically about getting patients in to these clinical trials, but it is addressing the issue of what the community of research and healthcare looks like um, as one of the ways that we can have inroads into outreach to specific patient populations and having them be more involved in the clinical trials uh, that are active now. And there's a lot of non-NIH uh, initiatives, a lot of community initiatives, just a few of them um, are listed here, that are trying, again, to address these issues. And I don't know how coordinated some of these um, efforts are, but there's an awful lot of them going on, and I don't know, maybe there might be opportunities for more synergism uh, among them. Uh, training opportunities and addressing the lack of uh, diversity. Um, again, this is, this is an area that NHGRI has played a leadership role in uh, for many years, um, and NIGMS as well. And there are many, many reports with recommendations for how to deal uh, with this. Many programs have, um, have come out of this for training um, at all levels of, of education spectrum. Um, we just can't stop, basically. Uh, these, these things have to be continued, um, monitored, um, and we need to make sure that we keep on, on top of this so that we can uh, uh, Im improve the number of minorities both in, in biomedical research, in medicine, um, and, and then use that as the basis for changing the face of the community for um, identifying and recruiting patients into these clinical trials. So recruitment of, of postdocs and faculty. So looking specifically at, at the part of the big effort in increasing diversity that, that relates specifically to sort of academia, to postdocs and faculty. Um, so some of the points that uh, members of the panel made were the outreach to historically black colleges and universities um, to use these collaborative relationships um, to leverage um, existing uh, uh, bodies uh, within NIH, such as the Division of Minority Student Affairs, um, looking at uh, finding liaisons, uh, that personal contact is essential, um, and to look at existing programs as models um, for how to do this broadly uh, across our academic institutions. Uh, and examples are, are given here, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming all of these slides are going to be available to all of you um, after this meeting. So in retention, uh, for the aspects of retention, so those are recommendations about how to recruit and get folks in, but then once they're in, they have to retain them in order for the impact to be 
real, and that Im involves having supportive environments, um, mentoring teams, minority members on faculty, hiring and mentoring teams, meeting frequently, um, cultural sensitivity. Um, all of these things um, are important and essential, and I'm not sure how widely um, in place they are across our institutions. And uh, I think this came mostly from uh, Cindy as, as uh, some examples of some resources that people could turn to uh, to look for very specific information um, about supporting um, and encouraging uh, diversity in research. So at, at the end, uh, we had a number of main points um, to, 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 to uh, convey to you about um, diversity. One is that, uh, just to reemphasize its importance uh, of diversity for both discovery of the variants um, and understanding their health relevance, um, that there are many, many training initiatives underway at NIH to increase diversity in the biomedical workforce, um, and those need to be continued. Uh, that the barriers to increasing minority and ethnic diversity both in things like clinical trials but also in research and in healthcare in general are quite diverse um, and that we need to continue efforts at all levels of, of scientific inquiry, medical practice and clinical trials um, in order to, to um, have some impact here. Um, now, I think as mentioning again is that the, the new Precision Medicine Initiative provides kind of another opportunity here for us to, to really uh, have an impact on the diversity gap. Um, and there's obviously we're going to have to leverage a lot of uh, efforts that are happening across NIH and also in the community in this, in this area. And I don't know logistically how that might be approached, um, but I think it really has to be. One of the starting points is to go to that RFI for precision medicine on the cohort um, and register the need to be sure that uh, the diversity of the American population is represented in the cohort that serves as the basis for this initiative. Um, so in general, I think the, the NHGRI program portfolio is quite comprehensive and it covers everything from basic discovery of variants to functional characterization to clinical use. But we need to make sure that in all those programs, uh, underlying all those programs, is an awareness of and deep attention to improving the representation of ethnic and racial minorities um, for both discovery and characterization. Um, and before we go then to the discussion, I just wanted to make sure that the panel members um, who contributed to these ideas had a chance to weigh in. Um, so uh, Cindy, why don't we start with you and then Vince and then Craig. So I think you know, part of it is our own uh, demographics in our state and our, our uh, patients and our prospective research subjects, but um, so there's, you know, relatively little that one can do for that, but when I look at some of the projects that we've had and talking to some um, of my uh, co-investigators on projects and, and um, how we did it, like in one of our earlier newborn screening uh, research studies that we did, um, I think the idea of, you know, the recruiters um, who are, uh, you know, able to speak the appropriate language and so on has really been helpful. Um, our CTSA has funded a, um, a van, a medical type equipped um, van that goes around the state so that, you know, it, it is a fairly large state and transportation is difficult for many families, so this is a way to overcome that. Um, uh, one uh, group, uh, part of our Center for Excellence in LC Research, um, a, a project that they've been working on the last few years, and they developed this community advisory group, um, very ethnically diverse, um, and they've really had input into uh, setting up the actual study itself. Um, part of that came from the success of enrolling our um, uh, students and, and fellows in, um, in the SEER, 
And, um, you know, I was struck, and specifically I need to give thanks to um, Deborah Skinner, who's um, one of the investigators in, in that um, project. But Deborah's really gone out, you know, to colleges and formed relationships. I mean, she really stressed the importance of one-on-one, -on -one, um, you know, building um, these, you know, communication uh, uh, abilities to, you know, get find out who's good at, at um, various, you know, colleges, universities, medical schools, and trying to recruit them, and um, uh, the importance of starting early so that, you know, if you're, if somebody's already completing their um, PhD, you know, they may not, you know, know about opportunities in, in genetics um, training programs, and so just starting early. Um, speaking as a program director for medical genetics, I don't think we do a very good job in this, and I think we, we could all do better, but it's, it's been a challenge. Um, you know, some of the programs like the ACMG Summer Scholar Program, and Jonathan heads that up at our, at our university, but, um, you know, certainly things like that are important. So funding um, undergraduate students and medical students for summer projects. Um, and, you know, getting them early. And um, also, uh, you know, being uh, one of the faculty in a genetic counseling training program, I think there's, you know, definitely a need to uh, recruit more underrepresented minorities to our genetic counselor population. And so again, you know, starting early, I think is very important, um, you know, even undergraduate high school age so, so. so I, I want to start by why is this important going really back to the question of why should we even be spending our energy and our time on this and I think this group in this room knows it better than most that there's a scientific imperative that we have to have ancestrally diverse populations in our studies to do really good science so there is a important scientific requirement to have the ancestral diversity. But then there's the flip side of a health equity and a social justice issue for our country to make sure that all of our population has the ability to benefit. So as, as we think this through and what we're doing and how within your projects and within your institutions and how our institute is thinking about this, we really need to be thinking about both of those issues. But it's primarily an issue that we must have strong science, and to have the strong science, we must have the, the ancestral diversity of the populations. And I think there's a couple issues I want to highlight. One is, um, there's been a number of studies over the last few years about participation in clinical research and underrepresented groups, and, um, and the historical issues of the U.S. public health uh, syphilis study, uh, commonly known as the Tuskegee syphilis study. And, and what we've learned is that people actually are not fearful of participating in re research. People want to participate in research if they see it benefits themselves, their families, their communities. Uh, and so it's really more this context of helping the public understand why to participate in research and appropriately, and again, that gets to the staff and the investigators involved, of reaching those communities. So, so I think one of our challenges in our research and research going forward is studying these issues in different ways of how do we engage diverse communities, communities that have been left out of research in new ways and new models and new strategies. And I think that's a area for real opportunity for research as we go forward. So I thank Carol for plugging the RFI. I'm going to plug it one last time, and the actual closing date is on the on June, Friday, June 18th. Um, but I asked this community to respond to it because it's asking both for strategies to engage diverse communities, and many of you have great experiences that you can talk about, or opportunities where new research is needed in that area to better understand to do that. And then it's asking questions about what are the potential health disparities, research science opportunities that a precision medicine initiative could do. And your perspective, 
as scientists on the ground doing this work, I think will be so important to be part of the content that we're able to share with the director. So, so I guess my first comment is there's a scientific imperative that we have to have ancestrally diverse populations, and so we need to figure out how to do that. Second, there's a social justice and equity um, from a perspective of our country and the health of all of our country. And third, people are willing to participate in research, and, and your voices, I think, are extremely important to help our institute, help NIH, and help our, the broader policy issues of this, of making sure that that occurs. So I appreciate the opportunity. I just want to emphasize a couple of things. One is this notion of health disparities. Um, it really exacerbates the whole problem that the clinical trials side shows. We are seeing a change in the epidemiology of a number of diseases that are unprecedented over the last 30 years, and, and it appears to be continuing in an unabated fashion. And so it's back to the scientific imperative that if we're going to understand these changes, we, we better be looking at the right populations. And the right populations is a diverse population a, and a diversity of populations. And so that's going to become more and more of a challenge. It becomes a challenge in the context of genes. It comes as a challenge in the context of genes and environmental interaction that we really have to address. The training aspects, we in our own institution and others I'm familiar with, we often have training programs. It's the pool of trainees and pushing it back even earlier and earlier into the training when we identify individuals that can come along. Um, by the time we get to a postdoc training program, we've lost a lot of opportunity in, in the background that I think we really have to get to. And then in terms of just the sequencing, um, Without sequencing diverse populations, we run into a number of problems. And just one anecdotal story, in neonatal diabetes, we identified a mutation in a gene that's known to cause neonatal diabetes. Um, everything is great. We wrote a, a report on that, ready to submit it on Friday, waited till Monday, and data on 1,300 individuals in a different ethnic group became available, and it turned out it was an ethnic-specific, looked like it was damaging mutation that doesn't cause this disease. Um, and so we've got to have, it's, it's almost the forensic problem all over again, and we're going to have to face that. 